So we are now moving on through the nephron. And we're going to go down the descending limb to the hairpin turn to the thick ascending limb. Again, the thin ascending limb. We are not even going to be bothered with it. It's not terribly exciting. It doesn't add new twists or turns for us. So that's why I'm just going to say, don't worry about it. Guyton and Hall doesn't even spend a lot of time on it. As we go through the loop of Henley, please understand it's going to appear that we are dissociating water from solute move, movement, and it will seem that <coughs> way. And when I first teach it to you that way, that's what you're going to hear. But then we're going to go to the board, and I'm going to put some pictures <laughs> up on the board, and then I think you will really see that water and salt movement aren't necessarily untethered. It's just we need to look beyond the apical membrane, we need to look outside of the <coughs> in the interstitial space. So first, we're going down the descending limb, and it's called the thin descending limb because it is made of simple squamous <coughs> epithelium. These are very thin cells, and they do have aquaporins inserted in them. That's what AQP means. And there are different types of aquaporins, and I really don't care which type we find. I just want you to know we find aquaporins. These are pores specific for water movement. Great. Well, we're going to reabsorb more water here. We're going to reabsorb, and if we go to our list, the descending limb, we're going to reabsorb 20% more of our filtered water. We're not going to reabsorb more sodium, but we will see some diffusion of sodium and urea into the filtrate. Very little sodium. And urea, it's going to diffuse in to the point where we get back the urea we reabsorbed in the PCT plus more. We're going to now have 110% of the urea that we originally started with. What? And again, how can we make something more concentrated? We can add solute and remove water. And in the descending limb, we're doing both. We're adding solutes, sodium and urea, and we are also removing water. By the time the filtrate gets to the hairpin turn, our filtrate is hyperosmotic compared to blood. It is four times more concentrated. So if we drank the filtrate, as we go down the descending limb, it would be getting progressively more and more concentrated. And by the time we got to the hairpin turn, it would be 1,200 milliosmolal. We would have a little bit more sodium, a lot more urea than what we filtered, well, 10% more than what we filtered. And the filtrate would be extremely concentrated. Any questions about that one? Yes. That would make it more salty. More salty. Now that's weird, isn't it? We have solutes coming in and water leaving. That's the smoke screen and mirrors that I told you, I warned you about. I, first two weeks of class, when you learned about your body fluid compartments, there was a slide where I told you water moves for one of two reasons. What were they? Hydrostatic pushing pressure or osmotic pulling. Okay, what typically caused a pushing pressure when we were in unit three? What caused push? Okay, vasoconstriction, but from what tunic? Media, smooth muscle. Okay, so what about pushing pressure here? Pushing pressure in the glomerulus was there because we had an afferent and efferent arterial. They have tunica medias. Does the nephron, did you, anatomy was a prereq. 
<coughs> Did you ever learn about the tunics of the nephron? You're all afraid to answer at this point because you've heard that so many times. Anatomy was a prereq. You're like, eh, I don't remember. No, there aren't tunics to the nephron. There is no tunica media in the nephron. So there is no push. So then why is the water leaving in this segment? Why is it being reabsorbed? There's only one other reason why. Osmotic pressure, pulling. But that doesn't make sense to us. If we are reading that sodium is going in, urea is going in, what is pulling water out? There has to be a bigger osmotic force on the outside of the nephron pulling the water out. And that's what I'm going to draw for you in just a moment. But I have, let me get to the other side. So now we're in the thick ascending limb. And it's called thick because now the cells are cuboidal. And when cells are cuboidal, they have more surface area than squamous cells. More surface area means more membrane space to insert membrane transport machinery, proteins. And on the thick ascending limb, on the apical side, we see a very unique transporter participating in secondary active transport. It is the sodium 2-chloride potassium transporter. It allows sodium to diffuse into the cell, two chlorides to also diffuse into the cell, as well as potassium. Four things are moving from the filtrate into the cell. That is a really hardworking transporter. And it's secondary active transport. No ATV is being used. On the basal lateral membranes, we have our reliable sodium potassium ATPase that is setting the stage. Low sodium in, high potassium in. Potassium is coming in through the apical side too, against its gradient. That's why it's secondary active transport when we think about the sodium 2 chloride potassium transporter. There's also hydrogen secretion. That's important for acid base balance. And we also see other electrolytes that can also be pulled across the fil from the filtrate into the interstitial space, but in a paracellular route. They're not going through the cell membrane. So let me show you that sodium 2 chloride potassium transporter. Here is the sodium hydrogen antiporter. Here is the co-transporter. ATP is pushing potassium in, and this co-transporter is also pulling potassium in. We now have a higher than normal potassium gradient, and that favors potassium diffusing through potassium leak channels. We've heard about those before and either leaking out through the apical membrane back out into the filtrate or into this interstitial space. Now what you can't see here, and I would draw it, draw a blood vessel representing the peritubular capillary bed. And this potassium that's leaking out through the apical membrane is bringing with it a positive charge. And that is a huge reason why it's driving other positively charged cations to be pushed through the paracellular route into the interstitial space on the other side. That's shown up here. So that filtrate becomes positive because of that back leak of potassium, pushing other electrolytes through that paracellular route. So now I'm going to draw on the other side over here, Rhiannon and Yasmin. Can you see if I draw over there? I tilt it like this. Is that better? Mm -hmm. And I'll keep it up there so if you want to take a picture, you can see it. Okay. All right. I need Let's 
So here's our loop with Henley. I'm trying to draw it just like I did in your homework packet. But how it is different right here with the thick ascending limb. You just heard me say that the thick ascending limb has the sodium 2 chloride transporters, which I'm drawing in blue. So here's my legend. So the blue circles on the apical side represent the sodium 2 chloride potassium transporter. So those solutes are entering the cells and then going out of the cells, out of the basal lateral membranes, into this interstitial space. Shown here is the green dots. Green dots represent mostly sodium. In your homework packet, you were asked to draw the peritubular catheter event. So I'm going to loosely draw this in pink. And it weaves around in between up, go back up to the early distal convoluted tubule. Anyway, so this is supposed to be your peritubular capillary bed. On the descending limb, how about purple? We'll have purple. On the descending limb, oh, sorry, I gotta make, I, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Got ahead of myself with my colors. Just pick a darker color like I did. And go over it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> On the descending limb, the purple represents your aquaforms. And you were told water is being reabsorbed. In the descending limb. And sodium is actually going in the filtrate. While the water is going out. Green going out in the ascent. When we look at the descending limb, honestly, I had it right. <laughs> I had it right the first damn time. I went over with the dark. <laughs> so it's changing over what that color is. Even darker color now? I would. No. <laughs> Everything's going to be Start over. Yeah. Why not? You've got time. <laughs> or you know what you could do? Just go to your homework packet where it's already drawn for you mostly. 
<laughs> Have you noticed that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's so myopic on your pictures, so it means up close vision. side we've got our aquaporins on the descending limb. <laughs> they are letting water to go out. Even though the sodium is going in. Now the thick ascending limb is reabsorbing 25% more of your filtered sodium load. How much water was reabsorbed in the descending limb? 20%. There is no tunica media. There is no smooth muscle. We all agree that the water leaving must be from a different force, an osmotic force. All of the salt that is being extracted, reabsorbed from the thick ascending limb is getting trapped here. And I'll explain why it gets trapped in just a moment. What I want you to see is that the thick ascending limb is reabsorbing the salt and putting it in the interstitial space not for its own sake, but for the sake of the descending limb. The thick ascending limb, I'm seeing the confusion, watch. The thick ascending limb is putting all the salt in this interstitial space to provide the pulling force to pull the water from the descending limb. There are no aquaporins in the ascending limb, only in the descending. So the thick ascending limb, being in close proximity, is pulling out the salt in higher rates, at higher rates, than the water being pulled out. That means we're getting very salty as we go deeper and deeper into the medulla of the kidney. If the water is leaving because it's attracted to the salt, by the time we get to the hairpin turn, it is so salty down here, close to the medulla, because all of the salt gets trapped here because we don't have really good blood flow deep to the medulla to capture the salt. So the interstitial space becomes 1,200 milliosmolal. Water keeps leaving attracted to the salt until the filtrate matches the interstitial space. We've reached equilibrium. You will do a physio -X where you muck with this interstitial gradient. And you will realize that the most you can concentrate your filtrate reflects how much you can concentrate this interstitial space. Up here, it's 300 milliosmolal. Then it gets to 600. Then it gets to 900. And deep, deep down here, it reaches 1,200 milliosmolal. More particles getting trapped here. That extracts more and more water until the filtrate matches the interstitial space. <clears throat> In textbooks, the reason why it's so difficult to draw this, as you saw with me, is because they draw it in a 2D fashion. That is not how the nephron loop is. 
it's actually the descending and ascending limb are twisted around each other like a twisted rubber band. So they are in very close proximity. The ascending limb extracting the salts provides the pulling force to pull the water out of the filtrate from the close by descending limb. Guyton Hall has, um, and I thought I put the link, but I'll double check that. Guyton Hall has a really bad video showing the establishment of this interstitial gradient. It's horrible, the sound quality is horrible. And in most colleges, you're expected to draw that loop over and over and over again with the filtrate and show how you establish the 1200 milli osmolal interstitial gradient. We've got bigger things to go for than to draw that over and over again. Back when I went to college and I had to learn this, I had to draw it in a flip book fashion because they didn't really have links. There was no web. There were really no links to videos. Any video you saw in class, it happens to be that the professor had a rare animation from the textbook publisher. And there was no access to that outside of class, so they had you make your own animation doing a flip book. Do you know what that is, where you flip the pages so fast it looks, and you make one little change each page? It was annoying. Guyton and Hall's video is just about as annoying, but I'll find it and I'll post it for you. But here's what you should know. Again, the thick ascending limb, and listen to this. The sodium 2 chloride potassium exchanger is out matching osmosis 25 to 20. It's out matching osmosis. That's crazy. How is it doing that? The thick ascending limb is setting the stage by having a huge amount of sodium potassium ATPases in the basal lateral membrane, indirectly fueling the gradient for the sodium 2-chloride potassium exchanger. So if we go back to our tally, in the descending limb, we had 20% reabsorption of water. We don't have reabsorption of sodium, not reabsorption. We have a little secretion, don't we? In the thick ascending limb, we have 25% reabsorption of sodium and no reabsorption of water. Let's do our tallies. Who, which, which is winning? The solute or the solvent for reabsorption? We are reabsorbing a lot more salt than water. Why isn't it matched? Well, that brings up a different topic, and it's one that you're going to hear me say quite a bit more when we get to Wednesday's lecture. It's called obligatory water loss. Obligatory water loss. You won't be able, you won't be able to reabsorb 100% of the water you filtered. You won't be able to. You can't. You are not a desert creature. You're not my desert tortoise, Mr. T. You are not a kangaroo mouse. Obligatory water loss. And here's a gross way to know this. Okay, so I'm sorry for all the audience out there. We are remodeling our bathrooms. And according to California code, you are supposed to have low flow toilets. Okay, that's fine. I'm not opposed to that. However, I want a really good low flow toilet. My contractor said, what do you mean by really good? I said, when I sit down on that toilet 
and if I flush while I'm sitting down on it, I want to have a clear and present threat that my ass might be sucked out with it. <laughs> that is how strong I want it to be. I want to be like, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Kara, I'm not so sure. I said, yes, there are happy. I said, I don't want any of these wussy, low-flow toilets. And you know what I mean. Have you ever gone to the bathroom, somebody else's toilet, you didn't know it was low-flow, plus it was wussy, and you went big potty in it, <laughs> and it's supposed to save water? Have you ever noticed that when you have more solid waste, you might have had to flush more? times to get it out, to get it down the toilet. Yeah, look, I, I know you have. You can, some of you are like, I don't go big potty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. I hate those. It's not saving water. It's not. I kind of like the toilets at some hotels where you can pick which flush standard you want. You know those, right? Different buttons. I love trying to figure out which one's which. Sometimes it's not logical. Sometimes I guess wrong and it's like, Phew! that's what I want in my toilet. Obligatory water loss. The more waste, the more water is obligated to flush it out of you. Understood? You have waste coming out in your urine. You have creatinine. You do also have urea. You have other waste molecules. To get them to flush out of you, you have to have a certain amount of water go with them to flush them out of you. That's <coughs> obligatory water loss. You will see we can get close to 100% sodium reabsorption. But we will never be at 100% water reabsorption. Could you imagine what that would feel like peeing out your waste if you had no water going with it? Weird to think about. You have to have some water go with the waste. Now, my desert tortoise, Mr. T, when he pees because his urine looks different from his feces when he pees I can hear it across the yard it sounds like it sounds if you could pee jello that's what it sounds like sort of now that's not I'm saying peeing out your urethra and it looks like cottage cheese. So imagine for a moment you peed jello like cottage cheese out of your urethra. And what that would sound like in the bathroom. <laughs> you see, desert animals have less obligatory water loss than we do. And here's the anatomical reason why. You heard in the first lecture that we have two different kinds of nephrons. What were they? Cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. And juxtamedullary nephrons have very long loops of Henle. 20% of our nephrons are juxtamedullary. 80% of cortical. If we could flip that, if we had 80% juxtamedullary nephrons, you would be peeing like my desert tortoise. Jello cottage cheese like urine out of your urethra. Now, I, I think for just four hours, we should be gifted that. Don't you think? Just for four hours, just to know. No? It would go back to normal after four hours. I just want to experience it. To pee jello or cottage cheese consistency. <laughs> Why would it be painful? He's not. Oh. Painful. His is all white, and snotty, and cottage cheesy looking. Gotta go out there and hose it down. 
but I can hear him do it from across the yard. Mm -hmm. Honey and I'll be out there working and I'll hear it and I'll go, oh, Mr. T just peed and Honey will go, how do you, how do you I'm like, come here, I'll, go, I'll show you. Obligatory water loss. If we were more like Mr. T, that's what our urine would look like, more concentrated. Because desert animals have more juxtamedullary nephrons. We do not have that. That means we will have to have more obligatory water loss. These two columns will never equal each other. They can't. They cannot. And that is part of the concept when I show you the math of why Bear Grylls and the producers of Man vs. Wild need to understand obligatory water loss and why drinking your own urine is not okay. And I'll prime you a little bit. If you are severely dehydrated, don't you think your urine would be extremely concentrated as maximum as you possibly can? And you still have to get out your waste. You collect that and you drink it back in. You now have to, you now have to get rid of the waste that you just peed out and consumed again plus the new waste that your cells are making. It's not like that your cells go, okay, well, I'm just gonna metabolically shut down now. Once they do that, you're dead. So if you reconsume your waste, plus then you have to add to it all the new waste that your cells are making, you're gonna have to require more water to get out the old waste and the new waste, aren't you? Yes, and you will end up losing more water than the water you took back in when you drank your urine because of this obligatory water loss. We do not drink our urine. I will again show you in the math. So this, count, this is called the counter current multiplier. And again, in a lot of schools, they have you do picture after picture, cycling through until you ultimately get this end picture. We're at the bottom of the hairpin turn. Our filtrate matches the osmolality as the surrounding interstitium. It goes from 300 to 600 to 900 to 1200, and the water keeps leaving until it reaches equilibrium. And the water is leaving because number one, it has permeability, and number two, because the thick ascending limb is creating that interstitial gradient, not for its sake, but for the sake of the close by descending limb. The thick ascending limb you saw in a previous slide is called the diluting segment. And the reason is, by the time the filtrate gets to the top, of the thick ascending limb, you have extracted more salt than the water you reabsorbed from the descending limb. We see that in the math. So how can you make a solution more dilute? You can either add water or remove solute. What did the thick ascending limb do? I didn't draw water going into the filtrate. I only showed solute leaving. By the time we go from the hairpin turn all the way up to the top, we go from 1,200 milliosmolal. By the time we enter the early distal convoluted tubule, the osmolality drops to around 50. From 1,200 to 50. We went from four times more concentrated of our, fil of our plasma to a fraction of it. So what would it taste like if we drank our filtrate going all the way up and go from extremely salty to very water-like? The reason why that salt builds up in the interstitium is not just because of that, that co-transporter, the sodium 2-chloride potassium co-transporter, but when we start to look at blood flow deep into the medullary area, we don't have a lot of blood going to that area to pick up the extra salt. So it just kind of hangs out there in limbo. And it turns out that very salty gradient is important for our juxtamedullary nephrons.
especially we, when we are in times of being severely dehydrated. But please understand, not only will salt be trapped there, but urea. Okay. In the descending limb, you learned that salt goes in, but so does urea, doesn't it? Well, you just heard me say urea is trapped in this interstitial gradient. Well, where is it coming from? We're not there yet. We have to get to the medullary ducts and collecting ducts, and there we're going to see special urea transporters taking urea out of the filtrate, putting it into the interstitium to add to the saltiness so we can extract as much water as possible. And that will be extremely critical when we are dehydrated. So again, it's really hard to take a trip through the nephron because when we look at pictures of a nephron in a textbook, it's 2D. And as we take a trip, we're, we're taking a snapshot in time. But I'm hoping that you're starting to realize that really other segments are influencing the activity of earlier portions of the nephron. We, gotta, we can take a trip, but then we got to kind of loop around and see how a later segment is influencing the action, the physiology of an earlier one. That's really hard to do, to think of it in a 3D scale. The early distal convoluted tubule is considered to be a continuation of the diluting segment. Why do we call it that? We're still going to have more solute reabsorption without water reabsorption. We have a sodium chloride co-transporter on the apical side. Do not worry about the diuretics that have been shown on these pictures for this lecture. We will go back through the nephron and we will talk about diuretics and where they work. So you will see these pictures again with explanations. So again, we're going to get more reabsorption of salt from the early distal convoluted tubule. We're going to get about another 5% more, no water reabsorption, which brings our tally to 97% sodium reabsorption. We have 3% remaining. Do we need that last 3%? Do we need to keep it? Or should it go to the toilet? That depends on your diet. If you are on a high salt diet, then that 3%, we probably want it to go to the toilet. But if you're on a low sodium diet, that last 3% can be tapped into. We're getting to the late distal convoluted tubule, and this is considered to be the variable part of our nef nephron, meaning what it does varies. It depends on your diet. Do you need more salt? You will even see potassium can be variable as well. What kind of intake do you have for those electrolytes? Do you have more than you need? Then we should probably have more go to the toilet. It's all about homeostasis, remember. And also remember from our first lecture that the early distal convoluted tubule is straddled by the afferent and efferent arterial, and that's where we find those macula densa cells that are releasing adenosine or not, and targeting the afferent arterial, and telling it to either dilate or vasoconstrict, regulating how much blood flows into the glomerulus, changing our starling force called glomerular hydrostatic pressure. In the late distal convoluted tubule, we have our sodium potassium ATPA setting the stage. We do not have any urea permeability. We have not had urea permeability since the descending limb where urea was going into the filtrate. On our apical side, we have a sodium and potassium set of leak channels. These are leak channels. 
Potassium wants to flow out the leak channel, down its concentration gradient. That means we're secreting potassium. Sodium wants to come in from the filtrate into the cell, down its concentration gradient. And we will see, starting in our lecture on hormones, that the hormone aldosterone targets this area of the nephron exquisitely. It will lead to more sodium potassium ATPase activity. It will also lead to changes in these leak channels. Again, this is our variable region. Do we need to have more sodium reabsorption or should we let it go to the toilet? Do we need to have potassium secretion going to the toilet or should we keep potassium? It all depends on if our patient is having hyper or hyponatremia, kalemia. Now we're going to the medullary duct slash collecting duct. Now, if you're reading Guyton and Hall, they will tell you that in the distal convoluted tubule and medullary duct, you have two kinds of cells, that you have principal cells and alpha intercalated cells. Is that the question you're going to ask? Okay, good. It says that you have both in the distal convoluted tubule and medullary duct cells. However, I am drawing a testing line. Okay? We are not going to pay attention to Guyton and Hall as they describe. I want very clear boundaries for testing. We will agree that principal cells are found in the late distal convoluted tubule and that those cells will only respond to aldosterone. Listen carefully. That those cells will only respond to aldosterone for the sake of salt and water management. <clears throat> We will agree that the medullary duct slash collecting duct cells have alpha intercalated cells. These cells, you will learn, also respond <coughs> to aldosterone, but in a different way. They respond to aldosterone for the sake of acid base maintenance. So principal cells respond to aldosterone for the sake of salt and water. Alpha intercalated cells, for, they respond to aldosterone, but for the sake of acid base management. True, they are found, both are found in the distal convoluted tubule, specifically the late. If you're reading Guyton and Hall, true, both are found in the medullary duct cells and collecting ducts. True, true. True, if you're reading Guyton and Hall, they both respond to aldosterone and ADH. ADH as well. But again, I'm drawing lines. Yes, both cells will respond to aldosterone, but for different reasons. And ADH, we're going to say, well, ADH targets different kinds of medullary duct cells and collecting duct cells for the sake of inserting aquaporins. We'll tinker with this more. We're going to massage with these lines more as we go through the acid base lecture and the hormone lecture. Yes? So for testing purposes, we said the principles are in the late distal convoluted and the alpha uh, intercalated lower layer. The they're, they're both in both. Right, but for testing purposes. For right now, here, here, here. for right now, can we just say that they both respond to aldosterone, but for different reasons, 
and they're both found in the late distal convoluted tubule. And then as we move on Wednesday and into acid base, we'll tinker with that even more. Okay? It just takes me a while. It really does. Too many things going on. Do not worry about this bicarbonate statement until we get to the acid base lecture. So there's there's quite a bit on these slides that I have not addressed because I need to backfill with information for us to move forward for some of this. When you start studying for lecture unit four, you will have the whole story. And when you start reviewing your slides, you'll come across this and go, oh, oh, okay, the rest of the story is from our acid base lecture, and let's go over what Kara told us. So there's a lot of going forward to come back full circle. Again, that's the difficulty. Segments later on have physiology that help earlier segments. Hey, okay, medullary duct collecting ducts. Definitely for testing purposes, we're going to say that this region responds only to ADH, even though if you read Guyton and Hall, it'll say also aldosterone, no aldosterone for testing purposes. Now, if you were to study with an IVC student or some Gold West college student, they'd be like, oh no, aldosterone works here too. Yes, I know. I'm trying to draw lines. And these lines go along with the pictures and questions in your homework packet. So again, a lot of forward to come back and backfill. And then move forward again and come back and backfill. In this region, we do see hydrogen secretion. And if you come back and study this PowerPoint again after your acid-base balance, you will see that there are two places that secrete hydrogen, yet when I give you your acid base lecture, you're going to hear me say, don't worry about those other two places where we saw hydrogen secretion. I don't care. We're going to focus on these other two for testing purposes. This will be one where I'll say, pretend this doesn't even happen. Just color it out. Okay. If you wanted to graphically take a trip through the nephron, watching the movement of solutes versus the movement of water, if you had the question in your head, how can I make a solution more concentrated or dilute, it's two answers. I can either muck with the solvent or the solute. But depending on where you are in the nephron, we know in some places water moves out while solutes move in, and we're getting concentrated for both reasons, less water and adding solute. And in other places, we're removing solute and we're not adding water. And we're getting extremely dilute. So for example, sodium right here stays pretty even through the PCT. Why? Sodium and water movement are pretty much equal, isoosmotic, so it stays pretty even. Then we get to the loop of Henle, thin. Why does the sodium concentration go up in the thin segment? Concentration, two reasons. Why can a solution get more concentrated? I can either add solute, agreed, and sodium does go in. Or I can remove solvent. That's the water leaving. Both are happening in the descending limb. Then when I get to the thick ascending limb, look at the sodium levels drop. Why? The sodium 2 chloride potassium co-transporter is removing the sodium at higher levels than how the descending limb removed water. So we are getting even more dilute. And then we get to the distal tubule and the collecting areas. Why do we see sodium going up here? Why are we seeing sodium going up? So you could predict sodium is going in. 
or water's leaving, right? And water would only leave at those regions if we have ADH. And that's the story that I, I have to come back and backfill on Wednesday when we go through our hormones. So we would assume from this picture that we have ADH around, and that's the reason why we are reabsorbing water from the filtrate. And whatever particles remain, they're becoming more concentrated in a smaller volume. There's a lot of moving parts to the renal system. Renal and respiratory are the hardest systems. There's a reason why we save them for last. If I started with these two systems, there'd be two of you left. I don't, I don't want to do that. I understand in college a lot of professors do want to do that. I do not. I like all my babies to stay. It's true. I know I'm stupid that way, but it's true. My honey's like, you know, if you started with unit four, your grading would be so much easier. <laughs> I am aware, but that is not responsible teaching. He goes, why not? Everybody else does it that way. I said, really? If I came home and did that, he teaches teachers how to teach. Do you think he really wants me to do that? No. No. Selfishly, he does so that he has me more to himself because he needs energy. He's like a three-year-old. He needs entertainment constantly. <laughs> <laughs> We've been focusing for the past two and a half hours on how we get things to move, solutes and water, things, to move from the filtrate into the interstitial space. Well then how do we get the solutes and the water from the interstitial space back into the peritubular capillary bed? The starling forces all over again. Except that at this point, we do have all four to contend with. We have two in the capillary, and we have two in the interstitial space. We have capillary hydrostatic pressure, same old story. It opposes water moving in. We have plasma proteins that weren't able to be filtered, and they are definitely a pulling force to pull the water from the interstitial space back into the capillary. There are proteins in the interstitial space that would favor water to stay in this area. And there's water pushing, there's no lymphatic drainage. So the hydrostatic pressure is actually favoring in. Remember when we saw that in unit three? And you all went, why is Guyton Hall showing interstitial hydrostatic pressure favoring inward movement when Kara is saying, no, it would favor out. And it's this negative pressure like a vacuum and this damn lymphatic drainage. There isn't that here. And we do the same thing. We add all the ends, everything that favors in. We add all the forces that favor the water to stay out. We subtract the two, and whatever side wins, that's the way the water will flow. And if you look carefully, this number, 10 millimeters of mercury of pressure favoring water plus solutes dragging with it back into the peritubular capillary bed, that number, 10, was the amount of force at the glomerulus that favored outward flow. <gasps> so in one capillary, we have a force favoring filtration. At the other capillary, we have the same force favoring inward movement. Wasn't that nice and tidy and neat? It's darling, isn't it? Hmm? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Afferent arterial led to the glomerulus. Efferent arterial. Last week you had a quiz. One of the questions was, what were the starling forces applied at the glomerulus? There were three. You had capillary 
hydrostatic pressure favoring out filtration. You had capillary colloid osmotic pressure that opposed filtration. You had Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure that opposed filtration. You had two against one. But if you go back and look at those numbers, the one that favored filtration outmatched the other two by 10 millimeters of mercury. And that 10 millimeters of mercury was enough for us to get 125 milliliters of filtrate formation per minute, our GFR. Now we've gone through the efferent arterial. Now we're in the peritubular capillary bed. We have all four, four, all four starling forces applied now. We have forces that favor inward movement into the capillary, outward movement to stay, to stay in the interstitial space. If I add all the ins, if I add all the outs together and subtract the two, I see the number 10 here again. But now it's 10 millimeters of mercury of pressure favoring fluid and solutes to move into the capillary bed. So we had forces that favored filtration in the glomerulus at an overall net of 10 millimeters of mercury. And now the forces favor inward movement into the capillary. Again, 10 millimeters of mercury favoring a pressure favoring inward movement. Is that better? That's a lot tonight, isn't it? Oh, I know. So here, to do it again, we have two capillaries in tandem. This is very unique anatomy. This is called a portal system. That's not the first time you've heard that word, that term, portal. We have an arterial portal system. That means we have an arterial leading to a capillary, but whoa, we don't have a venule, we have another arterial. And then that leads to a second capillary. And then it leads to a venule. At the glomerulus, you learned about your starling forces. Last week you had a quiz on them and you learned that one against two and the one favored filtration, GFR. Now tonight you learned in the second capillary, we have all four starling forces and our starling forces favor inward movement of water and the solutes go along with it. R here stands for resistance. If resistance goes up, think vasoconstriction. If resistance goes down, think vasodilation. So at the first capillary, if arterial pressure goes up, wouldn't that favor more filtration, more outward movement of water into the neck wall? But if arterial pressure goes up in the peritubular capillary bed, what would happen? If this arterial pressure goes up here, we're not going to see as much reabsorption. It would oppose reabsorption. If we have increased resistance of the afferent arterial here, vasoconstriction, we would have less blood arriving here, wouldn't we? We would have less filtration. We talked about that last week. But if we have vasoconstriction here, less blood coming here, wouldn't there also be less blood coming here? And that would mean that the pressure in this capillary bed would be going down. That would favor reabsorption of water. If the efferent arterial vasoconstricts, we learned last week that that would dam up blood here and favor filtration. But downstream, this would decrease how much blood that's getting to the peritubular capillary bed. Hydrostatic pressure would go down in this capillary, and that would again favor reabsorption. There has been a lot of information tonight, and we're only still scratching the surface.
We've only covered filtration last week, reabsorption tonight. Now I'm going to tell you all about secretion. You ready? And you're saying, Kara, it's the end of the PowerPoint. Is there another half? You spent 32 slides on reabsorption. Where's the other half? Nope. Secretion is reverse of reabsorption. And done. Secretion. Anything going into the filtrate is secretion. Oh. 